And now it is my absolute pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker for the morning. He's our own staff minister. He is a, a writer extraordinaire. And in fact, this morning, please avail yourself of one of the pieces on the notice board. I'd like to ask you to help me to welcome to the podium, podium Reverend Michael Record. Good morning, friends. And it is my pleasure to be welcomed to the podium by Jennifer. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Welcome to Sunday morning service here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. Those who are in church already know that we are having an absolutely beautiful, beautiful day. There's a golden sun shining in the blue skies with just enough cloud cover to make it cool and the beautiful flowers, red predominates with a bit of white at the gates. Lovely, lovely day here in Kingston, Jamaica. I'd like to offer an invitation to those who are not experiencing fine weather. Perhaps those in the Bahamas, which just suffered so terribly from the onslaught of Hurricane Durian. And perhaps those in some of the eastern states of the US, who are, which are being affected even now. I'm inviting you, those who can make it, to come to Jamaica and de-stress in an absolutely delightful environment. Uh, and those who are here do appreciate what we have. It's lovely here in Jamaica. My talk this morning is, has a lot of letters in it. It's AI in SOM. And that means appreciative inquiry and science of mind. Please raise your hands if you've heard or seen the phrase appreciative inquiry. Okay, and please keep your hands up if you know what it means and you could come up here and explain it. <laughs> okay, one, a couple of hands. Good, good, good. There are some hands who, of the people who know and can explain AI. But most of you didn't put up your hands. But all of you, except first-time visitors, and in fact there are no first-time visitors, should know the term. If you don't, it means you haven't read the notice on the notice board. It's been there for a week or more. Or you haven't read the most e recent email from Lorna. She sent a replica of the notice via email. So it is with great pleasure that I tell you what the notice says. <laughs> Inter alia, among other things, the email and notice, which is, by the way, it's the latest bulletin from the thriving ministry council. The notice states, I quote, I quote excerpts from it. We are excited to announce the hosting of the first part of our appreciative inquiry, there's the phrase, to take place on 12th October with our quadrants. This is the first stage of the appreciative inquiry process. The second stage will uh, incorporate the entire church, including stakeholders, and will likely take place sometime next year. However, if you are not a quadrant member and you can't wait until the larger appreciative inquiry, 
and want to attend the event in October, then join a quadrant. The only qualifications you need are enthusiasm and commitment. Since your skills are sure to find a home in at least one of the quadrants. Remember the quadrants are culture, consciousness, organization, and community. Join by September 30 and you will qualify to attend the all quadrant appreciative inquiry to take place in October. And it's signed love and blessings, Lorna. So that's the notice on the notice board and that's the email that most of you would have gotten online. Now the email does not explain what appreciative inquiry, I'm going to call it AI, is all about. But you could have Googled it, those who saw it and don't know what it is, you could have Googled it. There's tons of material about AI online, in writing, for those who want text, and in YouTube lectures. It's well worth the trouble. And I hope that even after my brief overview of AI, you'll check it out yourself. It was conceptualized, just to give you a little bit of background, it was conceptualized by Dr. David Cooper Ryder for his PhD dissertation in 1986. In the 33 years since, it has grown way beyond dissertation stage and is used by and for businesses all over the world. Even if the thriving ministry council was not going to use it for the benefit of this church, you, you personally, will find it of great use in your personal and your business affairs. In essence, AI is not a new concept. It's all about to use a phrase, it's all about looking for the silver lining on the edge of the dark cloud. It's about searching for the positive in the negative. Jennifer just read about the benefits of optimism. Well, AI calls for you to be optimistic in the face of adversity. Here are some more benefits of optimism all discovered, by the way, through actual scientific research. I'd like you to think of them as the context for AI, which we will be going into in some detail later on. But now, some, of the, some more benefits of optimism. Optimists don't give up as easily as pessimists and are more likely to achieve success because of that. Some optimistic businessmen, and the quotation, the, the example that I got was Donald Trump, very, very successful, have been bankrupt even multiple times, but they have been able to persist. That's the quality, persistence, and turn their lives into millions, their, turn their failures into millions because of the optimism. Next, in a study of clinically depressed patients, it was discovered that 12 weeks of cognitive therapy, and cognitive therapy means simply reframing a person's thought processes, worked better than drugs. The changes were more long-lasting than a temporary fix that drugs give you. Patients who had this training, this cognitive therapy training in optimism, had the ability to more effectively handle future setbacks. Next, in a study of 99 Harvard University students, those who were optimistic at age 25 were significantly healthier at ages 45 and 60 than those who were pessimistic. 
and other studies have linked a pessimistic explanatory style you explain things pessimistically with higher rates of infectious diseases generally poor health and earlier mortality it pays to be optimistic a retrospective study going back way back of 34 healthy baseball players who played between 1900 and 1950 indicated that optimists lived significantly longer than those who were not optimistic. And other studies show that optimistic breast cancer patients have better health outcomes than pessimistic and hopeless patients. Last one. Optimists also tend to experience less stress than pessimists or so-called realists. They believe in themselves and their abilities and they expect good things to happen. They see negative events, so-called negative, as minor setbacks to be easily overcome. And they view positive events as evidence of further good things to come. They also take more risks and create more positive events, generally speaking, in their lives. Some benefits of optimism. So try to be as optimistic as you possibly can. It's good for your health. I'm sure that most of you here in this church and listening to me online are optimists. You see, humankind can be divided into two groups, can be. Many, many pairs of binary groups, but those binary groups include optimists on one hand, pessimists on the other. And so both have been around as long as there have been human beings. We know that from oral histories. We know that from ancient texts, like the Bible, for example. They speak about the importance, even necessity, of being optimistic. Example, in Philippians 4, verse 8, we read, I quote, Brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. That's optimism. And in modern times, to jump from the Bible to more modern times, Peter Drucker, some of you know him as the management guru. He states, I quote, the role of leadership is to increase the strengths of the organization so that the weaknesses become irrelevant, unquote. Now that makes so much sense. We, most of us here, including your speaker, we waste so much of our time lamenting the things we can't do and worrying about our weaknesses instead of identifying our strengths and increasing those strengths. Tell me if that, that is not your habitual, <laughs> at least sometimes, position. Let me refer to Usain Bolt. He had scoliosis, curvature of the spine a negative, quotes and quotes, medical condition. But he didn't let it prevent him from becoming the fastest man in the world. He worked around it. So should we all. Just because you can't sing doesn't mean you can't draw. There are some things you can't do, some things you can. Just because, just because you can't draw doesn't mean you can't sing, and so on and so on. So focus on your strengths, folks. That's the optimistic way of doing things. But while optimism is an essential part of AI, appreciative inquiry, it is not the whole of it. Optimistic, optimism is an attitude. 
AI is bigger, much bigger. 33 years it's been around, as I tell you. It's a philosophy. It's an approach to life with many more complex systems and principles than just optimis optimism, the attitude. I'll get to the principles and steps in a moment, but first I want to tell you about a man that I really have a lot of admiration for. I want to tell you about Trenchdown and Dr. Henley Morgan, who is working miracles in the area using an AI approach. But he calls it by another name. You'll see later. Those who were Tuesday evening, spiritual night evening service on September 3 would have heard some of this before. And I hope you won't be bored when I repeat some of the things. Oh, speaking of bored, reminds me of an event my daughter in Brooklyn emailed to us my wife and myself, a couple of days ago. She woke up her three and a half year old son, my, my grandson, for his first day of school on Wednesday. She says to him, come on Yakub, time to get ready for school. So he turns over and looks at her and he says, again? <laughs> you see, a week before she had taken him to the school for orientation. And he quite enjoyed himself playing with the other kids and on the swings and the rides, etc. So he thought that having gone once, that, that was it. Not knowing that for at least the next 20 years, if life spare, <laughs> he's going to be going to school most days of the year. You see, folks, like education, AI involves a lifelong process. It's a, what Jesus called a born again process. You must be born again. You've got to change your old attitudes and start adopting new attitudes. That's what born again means. Dr. Henley Morgan calls himself a social entrepreneur and he defines that as one who does business in order to make a social positive impact. What's the purpose of the average business? To make money. But social entrepreneur, it's to make a positive social impact. Now friends and family of Dr. Morgan were horrified in 2003, when Dr. Morgan told them he wanted to set up business in Trenchtown, they pointed out all the problems that they saw, also called, by the way, needs, problems, needs, same thing, of the area. Example, high levels of youth unemployment in a community of 27,600 limited opportunities for training, high levels of high school dropouts, the prevalence of poor parenting, high levels of crime and violence, and substandard infrastructure and social services. That's what they pointed out as the situation in Trenchtown. But Dr. Morgan perceived the area differently looking through the lens of an asset-based community development strategy, asset-based, assets-based community development, A, B, C, D, he regarded what the situation there as assets filled. He saw a young trainable population, which is true, he saw a rich cultural and musical heritage, which you know is true. What place is more famous, even perhaps than Montego Bay in Jamaica, than Trenchtown? Rich cultural and musical heritage, a wide range of educational institutions, which is true, as well as churches 
and civil society institutions and an internationally known brand. That's what he saw. So did he follow his friends and relatives who were saying no? no of course not. He moved there in 2004 and he established his registered company, Agency for Inner City Renewal, AIR for short. And guess what? Today, he has hundreds of residents employed by AIR in a third party outsourcing arrangement. What happens is AIR employs the residents and then hires them out to work for other companies outside. Nearly $200 million flows into Trenchtown annually as a result of that arrangement. Trenchtown and the immediate environment has also been experiencing, Dr. Morgan says, the fastest homicide decline in Jamaica. And he, I'm quoting him, he, no longer, he says, is young men dying and mothers crying an everyday occurrence. No longer. Homicide rape plummeting. I learned all this last November when I attended a lecture by Dr. Morgan at UTech. It was a duplicate of a presentation that he had presented in the US at the White House about a month or so earlier. In his lecture, Dr. Morgan made a case for this new approach to community transformation, advocating a rejection of the traditional needs-based analysis and the adoption of the assets-based approach. The former looks, as I said, negatively at the needs of a community, the problems of a community, and tries to solve the problems. The latter, the assets base, looks at the assets of the community and builds on them. A couple of quotes from Dr. Morgan. You get different outcomes when you plan to solve problems from the outcomes you get when you plan to reach objectives. So don't try to so look for the problems to solve. Set yourselves objectives to reach. And another quote, every community contains the seeds of its own redemption, no matter how dysfunctional that community, unquote. So in the most dysfunctional community, family situation, etc. There are the seeds of redemption. That is the AI approach. And that is the approach Dr. Morgan suggests. And I would like us here at the temple to consider adopting AI as we serve the church and also in our personal lives. Its steps and principles, as I say, are quite different from the traditional approach to problem solving. With problem solving, I'll tell you the four steps of problem solving. You probably know them. One, you identify the problem, the obstacles, the gaps, the weaknesses to eliminate, number one. Then, perhaps in brainstorming meetings, you come up with several possible solutions. Next, you analyze the solutions in terms of costs, time, resources, etc., and you choose the best solution. And fourthly, you implement the chosen solution, standard problem-solving approach. Your aim is very, very reasonable. You have a problem, you want to solve it. And that approach works very well with machines. If your car engine is giving trouble, it's right to look for the problem and solve it. However, with the AI approach, where we are dealing with people and their psychology, you approach the situation or project 
from the opposite direction. AI is grounded in what is called positive psychology. And let me just give you a couple of senten sentences on positive psychology. It's con it was conceptualized by Professor Martin Seligman, and it is the study of happiness, flourishing, and what makes life worth living. Positive psychology. Seligman speaks of five factors of well-being. Positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning and purpose, and accomplishments. Please Google positive psychology or Martin Seligman. It's a whole philosophy in itself, and it's worth a whole new talk, which I can't give here. So let's get back to AI. I'll give you first the six principles of AI, and then the five specific steps you follow when doing an AI project. Principle one, it's called the poetic principle. Every situation can be perceived like a poem in an infinite number of ways, and so can constantly be reinvented. Principle two, social constructive principle. What we call reality is socially constructed by many people working together, each with a different point of view, and the sum total is what we call reality. Principle three, the simultaneity, simultaneity principle. As soon as you start asking questions, the situation begins to change. Questions determine your direction. Principle four, anticipation principle. We grow in the direction of our vision and visualization. Where we look, we move towards. So focus on where you want to go. Principle five, positive generative principle. Positive thoughts and emotions enable us to free up our energy and capacity to cooperate and give birth to our best ideas. Principle six, wholeness principle. Take into account the whole system and the contribution of all your stakeholders. Now, the five steps. They are define, discover, dream, design. Define. Think about this not only for your business, but in your personal life. Define. Clarify the key intention that you have personally or your organization has. Discover. Find out what in yourself or the organization has already exists that you want more of. Look into yourself, into your organization. What is there that you want more of? And focus on that. Discover that. Three, dream. Visualize your desired future in concrete, embodied way. See the house. See yourself living in it. That's dream. And design. Plan systems and structures that are necessary, in your opinion, to achieve both the long-term and the short-term objectives. And finally, deliver. Choose the actions to be taken, then implement the plan of action. Those are they. The principles and the steps of AI. There's no doubt that AI, and more generally, doing things with optimism, work. That's why approaches like the Dale Carnegie approach and the Anthony Robbins approach, which Reverend John can tell you about, you can walk on fire, and Napoleon Hill, they all work, they're optimistic. But we in religious, we in religious science have a little added dimension. Most of the people who 
are optimistic and follow those Anthony Robbins, Napoleon Hill, etc. They are quite satisfied that they work. They don't bother to find out why they work. But we in religious science who study science of mind find out the why. Ernest Holmes, founder of religious science, opens his book, How to Use the Science of Mind, with a sentence that begins to explain the why and is also, in my opinion, perhaps the most comforting sentence ever written. I quote, there is a power for good in the universe available to everyone and you can use it. Close quotes. Please repeat for me. There is a power for good in the universe available to everyone and you can use it. Repeat it one more but substitute I for the you. There's a power for good in the universe available to everyone and I can use it. Consider the implications. That power is universal. It is everlasting. It is a power for good and you can use it. What's the logical question that follows when you hear a statement like that? How can I use it? Well, in the next paragraph of how to use a sense of mind, Dr. Holmes anticipates that question and a couple of others. He says, I quote, this book teaches you what this power is, how it works, and how you can use it to help yourself and others. Clearly, that is a book that you want to keep at home and in your office, yes? Or if you like company while you study, you can come to classes here. In the Science of Mind, our main text on page 144, writing about consciousness, Dr. Holmes explains further. We are all immersed in the atmosphere of our own thinking which is the direct results of all we have said, thought, or done. This decides what is to take place in our lives. Thought attracts what is like itself and repels what is unlike." Unquote. Dr. Holmes also writes, the philosophy of spiritual science mind healing is based upon the conception that we are living in a universe of intelligence, a spiritual universe. Thoughts are things, definite states of consciousness, and as they become subjective, they go into, that is to say, subjective, they go into our subconscious mind and spread out into universal mind. They operate through a creative field and tend to re reproduce themselves as form. Thoughts are things, a kind of matter, and they can take form. Just to reiterate, as I close, why spiritual mind treatment, why an optimistic approach to adversity, and why AI can all work. It is because we live in a spiritual universe, in an intelligent, creative mind. We live in that mind, and we think into that mind, using that mind. By thinking, we direct and co-create the conditions of our lives. Namaste.